And then just the well, I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything this morning, so I just figured everything was fine. Go ahead, go ahead. But just to let you know. Sure. Well, I was just going to show up, and, and, and if no one was here by the time the church got done, well, okay. So, but I'm five years old Thanks so much, Wendy. And um, sound okay? People hear me? 
I'm used to projecting without a microphone, but I understand for recording purposes, we have to have, to have it. So um, this is a little bit of an odd topic for me to talk about today, not Frank Lloyd Wright and Madison. Um, that's something we might expect, but I'm going to talk about an experience or a series of experiences I've had teaching Frank Lloyd Wright to undergraduate students in Madison. Um, and it's, it's partly for me that I wanted to talk about this because it was an extraordinary, it has been an extraordinary experience teaching these students. And I think it offers some lessons. I realize you're not students, but we're all students. Okay, at one level, we're all learning all the time. We're in here for this. So um, hopefully there will be some lessons in here for you, even if part of this is um, about me processing some of these experiences I've had with the students. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I'm happy to take questions at the end about the particular buildings I've talked about or some of the issues. So I moved to Madison 24 years ago. Um, just about to teach the history of American art and architecture uh, at Wisconsin. And when I moved here, I have to say that Frank Lloyd Wright was the furthest thing from my mind. Um, I visited Taliesin, of course. Um, I studied Frank Lloyd Wright in passing in graduate school. But I'll be honest, the exceptionalism of Wright, the fact that he was considered this genius, the best uh, architect in the world, is he called himself once, um, and his less than stellar reputation really didn't interest me. And my research was on the history of more ordinary kinds of architecture, things like barns, things like mass-produced houses. So Wright didn't resonate with me, but the longer I lived here, the more I became interested in Wright. And I'll be honest, some of it was uh, what seems an obsession with Wright in the city of Madison. We constantly regurgitate, I didn't bring in any slides today, but the prairie style um, in, in different ways, and I've, I've published about this and talked about it. So the longer I lived here, the more I became interested. Um, I worked with uh, a student um, for a number of years, uh, Adam Childers, uh, on a project on Marshall Urban and prefabrication in Madison. This is uh, an urban right prefabricated house. I'm sorry, some of the identifying information for some reason isn't uh, showing here, but we'll, we'll work with that as we go. Um, some of you also know I served uh, on a city commission in 2014, 2013-14, uh, to preserve or develop a plan for preserving uh, a Frank Lloyd Wright house and the Robert Lamp house, which is on the interior block. Uh, just off Capitol Square. And I can talk about specifics of some of these buildings later. But this interest that grew of mine over time uh, led me to teach in spring of 2016 and again past fall, the fall of 2023, a class uh, on the Frank Lloyd Wright. And in today's talk, I want to talk, today's lecture, I want to talk a little bit about my experience with these classes. And this is not to boast about their success, although they were very rewarding for me personally, but rather to think about the lessons that we, students, and I include everyone in this room, can learn from these buildings. And I'll talk about how I uh, taught this class in a second. There were field trips um, of a sort to these Madison buildings, but it showed me, and, and these are the points I want to get to today first, is that Madison offers us an extraordinary laboratory for learning about Wright, where we can deepen understanding of his work. Every major period of Wright's career, pretty much, is represented here in Madison. I also want to show, secondly, that the kind of immersive learning that I facilitated in this class, and you can see students visiting some of the houses uh, this past fall, um, is a way of engaging with these buildings that don't just sort of um, celebrate the architect, but help us understand his continuing relevance today. Um, and that's what the students learned and what I want to share with you today. So why did I teach a course on Frank Lloyd Wright despite my mixed feelings about the man? And those of you that are on Facebook know that there's a status, you can update your marital status and everything. And my relationship with Wright on Facebook 
would be, it's complicated. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just say that. So why did I why did I teach the course? Well, partly it's because students have, since I got here, um, in all of my classes, whether it's the big survey of art history or American art, are always like, what about right? What more about right? So it also made sense because Wright uh, has a relationship with Madison. And I want to talk a little bit about that here. Um, so for those of you that don't know details about Wright, he was born in southern Wisconsin uh, in Richland Center. He was the son of a preacher and itinerant uh, musician in general, uh, as uh, William Carey Wright, I can show pictures here, and Anna Lloyd Jones, um, who uh, was a teacher of Welsh descent uh, whose family had settled in southwestern Wisconsin in the area around Spring Green. Um, as a youth, uh, Wright traveled uh, quite a bit, but ultimately his family settled in Madison relatively permanently in 1878 when he was 11 years old. Uh, there's stories, and I can answer questions about this in the Q&A if you want, uh, about his mother, who you see pictured here, wanting him to become an architect from an early age. She decorated the nursery with uh, clippings from Harper's Weekly of great buildings. Um, and this led Wright uh, actually to UW-Madison to become an architect. Uh, many factors, including playing with a series of blocks, led him there as well. Um, he wrote about extensively um, his studies uh, at UW-Madison, well, not extensively, but wrote enough. You can read about this here. Um, he wasn't necessarily enamored of his education. Uh, at UW-Madison, but there's a lot of swirling questions about what happened at Madison. Here you see him belittling his studies in mathematics. Um, this is from the archives at UW-Madison. Um, rhetoricals, this is a note from the professor about Bright's performance, that he failed to appear in class. Um, he said at times he almost graduated. In fact, he was a special student um, that took a class here and there, uh, as far as we can tell. There's a lot of lore around this. Um, students are really interested in this because, of course, many of them take classes in Science Hall at UW-Madison. Um, and I won't get into the details of the building, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, Wright's involvement uh, in Science Hall. He was apprenticing uh, with Alan Conover, who was involved in the design and construction of Science Hall at the time. Um, and in his autobiography, Wright claims that he actually worked to build Science Hall. It's probably not quite uh, true, like much that Wright said is apocryphal, but his apprenticeship with Conover working in that office certainly was formative. David Mollenhoff, who uh, some of you probably know, has written sort of the definitive, well, Stu Levitan is not here, one of the definitive histories of Madison. Um, has said uh, it was from Alan Conover that Wright probably learned the most. Um, and that's significant. After this, he departed for Chicago, um, at least for a time. And I'm not going to talk about the very phase of his career. What I'm trying to emphasize here is Wright's relationship to Madison. Worked on buildings at the university, grew up here, at least spent a significant amount of time here. I'm going to pass on the, the quote, but this is Wright sort of going on and on. I forgot that I included it about. Um, how he built Science Hall, which is fascinating. He goes to Chicago for a time, uh, has an affair with Nana Cheney, runs away to Europe uh, with his mistress for a time, and then comes back and settles, uh, not in Madison, but in Spring Green. And after this, and yes, we can talk about the disastrous fire that and murder that uh, took Nana's life and that of several others of tell us, and we can talk about that. Again, what I want to stress here is when Wright moves to Taliesin and makes his home there, um, maintains or reconnects with Madison in an interesting way. And that relationship continues uh, through the end of his life. And I always um, like showing this photograph in the Wisconsin Historical Society showing Wright getting an honorary degree from UW Madison in 1955. And so I set this biography up less because of the details of it, and it's something that some of you know more or less uh, bits of it here and there, and probably know more than me about, um, certainly some of you in this room do, about Wright's biography. But to say that it was natural for me, I think, to teach Wright, um, and it was natural, I would also argue, 
um, to uh, have Wright talk regularly at UW Madison. And in the QA, I can talk a little bit about some of um, people at the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation who are really working hard with me and others to try to get Wright um, more in the curriculum at Madison. So, all this to say, it made sense for me to think about a course. Um, there were previous iterations of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright taught for decades uh, in the art history department where I uh, teach at UW Madison by my colleague, uh, the late Narciso Manical. Um, Narciso was an architect and a critic, a self proclaimed critic. He taught a two semester sequence on Frank Lloyd Wright. Can you imagine having two semesters on one person? He did it. Um, the first semester was on Frank Lloyd Wright's writings and philosophy, and the second one was on his buildings. But what Narciso did, and I respect my late colleague enormously, um, was lecture in a lecture hall. Narciso was an amazing lecturer um, and captivated students. The class would draw up to 90 students each semester, so it was kind of amazing. That speaks to Wright's popularity. But um, for me, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to give lectures. I was not a, a scholar of Wright, never have been, probably never will be. What made more sense to me was to get students out in the buildings. And that's what I did uh, when I taught the first iteration in the spring of 2016. And I, I taught this course, um, again, my relationship with Frank Lloyd Wright is complicated, um, under great pressure uh, from some administrators in my department. And I said, OK, there's Conditions that I will teach this course. First, if it's small, seminar size, not 90 students. Um, and then, uh, sort of secondly, if I could teach it in the field, getting students engaged with homeowners. And here they are talking with uh, the homeowner of uh, the Mary Ellen and Walter Rudin House uh, in 2016. Why did I want to teach this course in the field? Trust me, it's much easier to get up and talk in a lecture hall than to coordinate students getting to houses and working with property owners, um, trust me, much easier. But I, I did so because of two reasons. First is my belief in the Wisconsin idea that uh, people at the University of Wisconsin really have a mission for doing work in the community. Um, and so it was good, I think, to connect. And there have been some follow-up projects of various sorts with students with some of these homeowners. So that's really good, I think. That was one reason behind it. The other was, in 2016, I was um, reevaluating my teaching. I take teaching extremely seriously. I love teaching. Um, and I was thinking about new ways to activate learning. And this has become more essential in light of the pandemic, as students have become increasingly disengaged. But in 2016, we were dealing with students on their cell phones all the time. And I was like, how do I get them off their cell phones? Well. Um, one of the ways I thought to do this was to teach a course where they were out of the classroom and interacting with people, forcing them to, to be social um, in a lot of ways. So um, I taught the course in spring of 2016, and again uh, in 2023. This is in 2023 at the Pew House, which is in Shortwood Hills. And you can see the students listening to Elliot uh, Butler here talking about his house. Now, lest we think this is a course that is a bunch of field trips um, and a bunch of fun, it was that. Um, but what I really discovered uh, through this experience is that immersing students in the field, engaging with these buildings, prompted their understanding and thinking about right and architecture, and particularly thinking about right and its ongoing relevance in the 21st century. So it wasn't so much that we go to these houses and we talk about what a genius Frank Lloyd Wright was, and we can debate whether or not that's true, but really thinking about the lessons that Wright and architecture more broadly can offer us historical architecture in today's times. And that's what I really want to get into for the rest of um, my time with you today. The first few weeks, um, I did lecture in the lecture hall. Let's be honest, I gave what students um, considered the most boring class period, which was I surveyed Wright's 90 year career in two hours. I gave a lot of lecture about that as a kind of overview to get us all on the same page. Really, that was their least popular course or session of the semester. But then from there, 
next period and we brainstormed about what issues in that lecture and in general that the students found interesting to them. And so we worked as a class, um, and this happened both semesters that I taught it, and I was astonished, and I was reflecting on this yesterday, that students each semester in 2016 and 2023 found different things that they were interested in from the same material. In 2016, um, I'll be honest, they were really interested in right and sustainability. And then in 2023, they seem to be interested in completely different things, um, partly having to do, and, and maybe this is sort of some of the interest in taste from the pandemic or something, but they were super interested in how people have adapted the houses for reuse. So that was a theme that they explored. So as a class, we brainstormed themes and students formed teams to think about what they were going to be looking at on these class visits. So they went into the class visits knowing that they were going to work on themes and sort of thinking about the buildings relative to their research. So the themes that they focused on in 2023, for example, one was in mass production. Like how did Wright engage with plywood or thinking about building series of buildings? Like that was one thing that really interested students. Another was probably obvious, but how frankly Wright's buildings respond to the natural world. How do they use building materials? How do the lines of the buildings affect the landscape? Not surprising perhaps. Another group in, in this sort of has to do with that taste thing I mentioned, were really interested in uh, how people live in these houses, which are museum houses, right? But people still live in some of them, and they so they wanted to interview homeowners and like Elliot and really talk to them. And some of the homeowners um, who I owe a lot to um, were gracious enough to allow my students to interview them and talk to them. And another thing that uh, a group was interested in was how Wright's own sort of religious beliefs were manifest in some of his religious buildings. He built synagogues, the Unitarian Meeting House. So I thought I'd just mention that to this group, that there was a group of students that were interested in exploring uh, that theme. So with this in mind, we embarked um, on a series of visits to Wright's many buildings in Madison. Some of these you will recognize. Some of them you probably won't. Um, I guess I can move. Um, this is the Robert Lamp House, I showed it earlier, um, the Walter and Mary Ellen Green House um, in Hill Farm, 1959, a prefabricated house. This is part of the Jacobs II House, still privately owned uh, near Middleton. Um, this is obviously what you know, and as Eris, the, air, the so-called airplane house, the Eugene Gilmore House, which is in University Heights, first Unitarian meeting house. Uh, the first Jacobs House in Westmoreland uh, on Topher, and then this is um, the Q House uh, owned in by Elliot Butler, I showed him earlier, uh, in Shorewood Hills. The students got behind the scenes tours of each of these buildings. Some of them are public, some of them are private. Um, I will say this is off script. Um, someone was talking to me about this earlier. We did get into uh, the airplane house. Um, which is not usually open to the public. And um, it was, speaking of spiritualism, it was quite incredible. It was at dusk, and the owner was talking to the students about her experiences of owning the house and maintaining it as a livable space. All the while, she was saying, don't touch anything. <laughs> so it was a really interesting experience um, for the students. Um, all this to say, and I didn't give the dates on all of these, but beginning with the lamp house, we really do have buildings from, and I, the way I set up the lamp house, that it's transitional in right scholarship between sort of what I'm going to loosely call his Victorian or arts and crafts phase and the prairie style that he sort of came into in Chicago. But I treated it as a kind of Victorian late 19th century building in general, and it is in this like late 19th century neighborhood. So we talked about that. Um, and then, you know, it really extends through uh, the time of Wright's death in uh, 1959 with the Green House. So we could look at things from all of these different periods. <coughs> so Madison really is, as, I, as the title of my talk today suggests, um, a, a major laboratory for Wright's work. I do want to mention, I want to talk, returning to the class again, briefly how these visits worked, because it's kind of important for understanding what we did and the resulting products. 
Um, students, some of you that are familiar with educational theory, it operated kind of like a closed classroom. Students did the lecture stuff outside of class. So they read about building and the phase of rights work that it represented. Um, in advance of our visits and after they did those readings, they would post uh, what interested them about readings, what they wanted to talk about when we got to the site. So we had our uh, sort of seminar, if you will, um, on site in each of the buildings. So it was really cool because they told me in advance what they wanted to talk about. It was kind of like, it really was a different kind of teaching for me and one that I wish I could do all the time, trust me. Um, then we have the site visits, and I'll go through each of these. And then afterwards, their main writing assignment, other than their project, was that they would write a journal entry on what they learned. And the prompts were very simple. It was like, what did you learn this week you didn't know before? How did it build on your previous understanding? And they would write a page on that. And we'll see some examples of that later on. You probably can't see this, but these are, um, and I'll walk over, uh, the discussion posts. This is how we work now. Classes are all, like, even the ones that are face-to-face -face have an online component. So this is from the semester, August, um, in responding to the reading from the Pew House. Um, she wrote, uh, the Pew House discusses different influences in rights building, such as apprentices, how does outside influence from other workers on the Pew House, so outside of right, how did that impact the way the building works? So these are the kinds of questions. And so I would go into the Pew House discussion and be like, okay, how is this building realized from rights conception to reality? That was sort of what the discussions did um, for me. So the discussion board, the pre-class discussion board was really useful. Then we would visit the homes, and I'm showing you here the lamp house again. This was 2016. Um, I don't know if you guys know about the lamp house and where it is and what's going on with it, but the mid block and anyway, this gives me anxiety to think about. But anyway, it's in the middle of the block and there's development all around it. It's owned by someone with a I'm gonna be very vague here, vested interest in developing that block. Um, he didn't know either time that we were going to the lamp house, and I'm not trying to hide from him, but it just so happened that I had students from my class each semester who were renting an apartment in this house. And so they invited us in each semester, which is fascinating. So here we are, and we sort of, they had a rule in their um, in their uh, rental contract that they could only have six at a time. So I had, you know, six students would like come in too, they couldn't have big parties. So we would sort of sneak in, you know, this alley and go into the house at night. But anyway, these are the kinds of visits that we had. Most of the time it was more welcoming. Uh, thank you. Bill Martinelli for facilitating our visit to the Jacobs One House. Uh, most of the time it was more welcoming, but we would have these visits to the houses. We would have the discussion in class inside the houses. Um, and then afterward, um, they would journal about their experience. So here's the first Unitarian meeting house interior. Um, and I just want to give you, I'm not going to read all of these to you. You can read them on the screen or ask me about them later. But here is um, Alex in her journal reflecting on her experience. Um, what I really appreciate as our visits continue is the visibly changing light scheme from week to week. Watching the light pour into the meeting house and reflect from the outside of the building completely influenced my appreciation for it. Someone mentioned the cabin feel when sitting in the main area. I totally felt that. It felt intimate and unified. And the sun shining in unified it further. So you can't get this from a book, right? It's the way that students experience this um, and thought about it in, in these really, really incredibly engaged ways um, that meant so much for me. So the journals show, I here, I don't, okay. The journals really show this um, kind of engagement. And I wanna go through a few more examples to think about how building, how students connected these buildings with the issues that they were working on in their research. And I would argue issues that really brought right and its relevance into the 21st century. So returning to the lamp house again, um, a little traumatic to think about sneaking into this house, but in any case, um, as I said, we sort of were focusing here on Wright's transition to the prairie style. It's a transitional stylistic building. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about, and this is a map showing um, the location of the lamp house mid block. And around it originally, at least at the time of 2013, 
some of these are gone now, for a series of Victorian houses. So what Wright was trying to do in the Lamp House, most generally, was sort of put the house in its block and give it a kind of um, suburban envelope. So he put in a yard, so to speak, around it in this dense urban setting. And that has to do with his client, Robert Lamp. Happy to answer questions about that in the q &A. But in essence, it gave students a chance to really think not just about sort of the block location, but how one creates a yard in a suburban private space in this dense urban setting. We got to go up on uh, the uh, back here real quick. Um, at the top of the lamp house originally was a sort of open garden kind of space. Now it's been enclosed. We got to go up there, due to the student who was in the class that was renting, um, and really think about the ways in which this house in an urban setting engaged with nature. And it prompted this really interesting discussion about how one finds nature in urban space. And obviously the lamp house also gave students a chance to engage with civic issues as this property is much debated, and we, we actually, the first time I taught this class, we had Jack Holt's Twitter, um, who's a passionate advocate for the Lamp House, and Nan Fay, who was head of the Land Commission for many years, to talk about the preservation issues. And so, so, I had a student this past semester, we were talking about preservation, say, hey, can I get on, like, the Historic Preservation Commission in the city? How does that work? And I was like, you do you, you can do that realize you're going to, um, it's going to be quite a, quite a challenge. Um, I, I decided not to do that anymore. So that's the Lamp House. Um, moving on to the Jacobs House. Um, and I could talk endlessly, and I won't, about the Jacobs House as a prototype for uh, sort of mass, mass produced, if you will, suburban living, and how Wright tried to think about a prototype uh, for suburban housing. Um, through this house. Um, the visits to the Jacobs house are always a highlight um, for students at UW-Madison, thanks to the generosity of the home's owner, uh, Jim Dennis, who is a former colleague in the Department of Art History, um, and to the generosity of Bill Martinelli, who uh, stewards us uh, through these houses um, with Jim's work. Um, the Jacobs house is uh, super valuable and an interesting suburban prototype. My own research is on suburban housing, so I particularly like it. Um, but for students, they really, really love um, talking with uh, the owner, Jim Dennis, uh, about the experience. And Bill is here, and I can tell, tell him that um, the end of semester journals that the students wrote about, one of the highlights was talking with Jim Dennis, who his own and painstakingly cared for this house over time. And I mentioned earlier this idea of living in Franklin Wright houses was super interesting to the students. That engagement with owners who talk about restoring, changing, adapting, living in these houses, it took these houses out of the realm of sort of this great man and really engaged them and really thinking about them as living organisms. We all live somewhere, right? And so they were thinking about that. And I don't expect my students, although most of them were not our history majors, I had a couple of computer science majors this semester, go figure. Um, I don't expect them to be wealthy enough to purchase a Franklin Wright house necessarily, but um, I had a few say, wow, I would love to do that and, and be stewards of these houses. And I'm like, that would be great um, if you make enough money to do that. We did go to Taliesin. Um, I briefly want to talk about that experience. Um, we got a behind the scenes tour of Taliesin times. Um, What's really interesting about this experience for students um, is not only, and spiritualism came in here uh, in two discussions, was the way in which the students were talking with Taliesin staff about how Taliesin could better engage younger people. Um, and students were like, first off, don't charge $80 for <laughs> But they suggested to them uh, in 2016 having student days where students come out and draw um, and sort of do art projects at Taliesin. And some of these things actually were explored by the staff that my students suggested back in 2016. And I'm pleased to say um, the Taliesin Institute, which has replaced um, the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture on behalf of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, is really looking at ways to actively engage kids. Um, and by kids, I'm using college age 
but like they're really thinking about that. And, and the Department of Art History at UW Madison, I'm pleased to say, is thinking about that. We also visited places like Monona Terrace. We visited some other sites in Madison, like Milton Hills, um, to think about rights ongoing influence, what I call rightification. I published about this, this sort of obsession with regurgitating rights and divine elements over and over again. And students were super interested to think about um, those kinds of issues. So through these buildings overall, I would say, um, one of the things, and I didn't have a good slide to talk about this, but that overall students were really engaged with was what I see as a paradox in Wright's work, which is his respect for nature on the one hand, and his interest, and this is sort of a staple of right scholarship, but I could see it differently in buildings. His interest in nature on the one hand, and his obsession with modern technology on the other. So he used steel reinforced concrete in his buildings. He wanted to mass produce things, at least at the end of his career, he was experimenting with prefabricated housing. And as we all know, right, it was all about the landscape and all about the environment. And I think we're still struggling with these sorts of issues today, right? So I want to sort of, um, not quite ending yet, but I want to sort of end my tour of some of the sites we visited talking about the second Herb and Catherine Jacobs house built in the late 1940s on the west side of Madison. Um, you can see it in the rendering. This is an impossible building photograph. Um, it's known as sort of the solar hemicycle house. And this was Wright's experiment with what we might say um, sort of uh, ecologically sensitive housing. He designed it around the sun uh, to try to embrace the sun in the winter. So that he planned it such that the angle, you can kind of see the windows. Um, the front here were designed to sort of take the sun in the winter. Um, and then in the summer, he had it so designed with an overhang that the sun would be deflected. So it was cool in the summer, warm in the winter. And Wright was really designing around the sun. And students were like so taken with this house this time. Um, and the boars who owned the house were just so amazing. One of the students interviewed them um, and that sort of thing. Uh, they were just so amazed. They were like, wow, what does this offer us today? Like, it's just so cool. We're still trying to design with solar panels, etc. cetera. Um, and I think it really sort of speaks to that point that I'm trying to get across today is that this way of teaching got students thinking about not just, wow, isn't right an amazing architect, but how do we how can we learn from him today? How can we think about these things? I mean, I had a student say, well, we should just design this house over and over again. I'm like, well, maybe not. Um, it's kind of expensive and it is a one room house. There's no partition in it, so think about that. Um, but it is sort of interesting to think about the lessons it offers us. So in short, um, and I guess by way of conclusion, although uh, again, not quite a conclusion, I guess, um, the way that I taught this class through these buildings, getting students to do the homework outside of class, think about what they wanted to learn when they got in them, visiting them, and then reflecting on those visits, I would like to suggest is something that we all can do. So before you go to a right house, don't go expecting a tour. Do your homework ahead of time. Think about what's interesting to you so that when you're on the tour, you actually have you've been sort of um, armed with some information that you can think about and reflect on. So I think it's a model that can deepen our understanding of right and your own experience of architectural historic house tours. That's what, I, what I'd like to suggest. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to make you journal. I make you journal, of course, but I'm not your professor. But, you know, I just, and I'm not going to read them all because I'm running out of time, but the journals at the end, and I'll, 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 I will read one here in a second, that was profound, just really reflect the fact this is no ordinary teaching. That it's, when you're engaging one-on-one -on -one with buildings, and this is something I learned as an architectural story early in my career, I wanted to do a kind of architectural history that engaged with buildings, but it just really is different, and they learned at a different level. Um, this is uh, Claire talking about Taliesin, and not surprised that it was quieter than usual. Um, she talks about the emotionality of it, about the experience. Um, and again, I can make these available for anyone that wants to sort of read them. Um, here's Darren at um, the Rudin House. Um, how do, you, how do you teach space? The feeling of spaciousness 
in these buildings unless you're in the space. And so that was one of the things. I, this is an aside, I didn't have time to get into it today, I actually took it out, but we had a uh, speaker come in in 2016 talk about um, Wright's interest in Japanese print, which is well known, you know, some of his former prints in the Van Vleck collection at Chazen. Um, and it was really funny, after he left, this is a, a lecture at the end of the semester, students like got up in the classroom and started moving around, like trying to simulate what they heard him show in slides and think about how the prints were translated spatially. And so they just got up and started moving around and like trying to pretend like they were a building. It was like the weirdest thing. But it was sort of like how they learned space in that particular thing. So as I said, um, I'm going to leave Lily's up here for a while. It's much easier for me as a professor to lecture um, three hours a week. Um, I can prepare, I have end notes, I can do all of that. But this class was as useful for me, in many ways, as it was for the students, I deepened my understanding of right. I started thinking about right and this relevant in different ways. And that's been true both semesters. It's really been a profound experience. I don't expect any of my students to become art historians. In fact, I dissuade them from doing so, given um, the bleakness of the humanities, the job market, and even the fate of art history, uh, I would say, at UW Madison, which is not certain at this point. But I do think, and I think Lily's journal, um, which chokes me up every time I read it, shows me, Lily's a journalism major, um, that it can have an impact. So um, she talked about it, and this is why I wanted to show this one and, and read from it. Um, up, well, up here she talks about how it teaches her more about life than uh, academic lessons. And some of that was for her uh, sort of engaging with the material world, with building. Um, permanently changed the way she looks at the world's environment. But I loved this. As a student who started college in 2020, it's been the norm to feel disconnected from my educators. Um, and that's certainly true with Zoom, and a lot of us know that. This hasn't prevented me from excelling or learning, but it has hindered their impressions on me. It has been such a privilege to have the opposite experience in this class. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I'm always talking about it. Um, to me, it's a true reflection of how learning is supposed to be, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be part of it and to think about what I've learned in this class forever. I have heard from students in 2016 who took it the original iteration. They are connected to this class. They, I still hear from them, and I don't just hear from them when they go to a right building. I hear from them about the lessons that they learned in the class and how they've taken this um, into their own uh, sort of life. So for me, in short, buildings, and I'll end showing a picture of the class in 2016. These buildings are a product of a man, frankly, right? That some of us may call a genius. Um, but they're structures that live into the present, and they're structures that I think we can best understand by engaging with them one on one. We're all students of the built environment. We all live in buildings or occupy space in a landscape. Um, and buildings aren't frozen in time. Frank Lloyd Wright buildings are not solely important as a product of his genius, his making. So I was talking with someone before the class, they involve collaboration with others to realize them, to bring them into being, and they change. So I would encourage you, just as I learned through this class, to engage one-on-one -on -one with these buildings with an open mind. Ask questions, not just about rights and the factors that influenced him when he made them, but really about how they can offer us lessons about what to do or what not to do in the 21st century. And I hope my talk today has sort of promoted this kind of experiential learning. And I invite you, as we all are in Madison, with respect for the owners, don't storm their properties. But when they're open, private homes are open as they are, and I'm happy to talk about that. You know, go out and visit them. Do your homework ahead of time. Go out and visit them. We have an extraordinary laboratory uh, in Madison for thinking about Wright's work. Um, and I encourage you to take advantage of that. Thank you. questions. I just want to compliment you on your approach to teaching. Also, John. I was um, privileged enough to tour Falling Water years ago, 
And I had read about it, you know, this house that's built around, I don't know if it's a stream or a river, but it's a water, a moving water source. Yes. And actually being in it, I thought it was sort of a camera when I read right. about it. Right. But actually being in the house, it was amazing. You know the water, even though we were wet. <laughs> it was really an amazing experience. Yeah, it's different, and and you know this is this is obvious with architecture that it's different when you're in the space. That seems like an obvious point. Um, I would say that my my students in sort of intro art history, which I teach once a year, so introduction to Western art, are so intimidated by architecture they don't know how to deal with it. And I think it's because we put in flat slides, and they're like. You know, how do I read a plan? How do I understand the space? But what you're describing in falling water makes sense to me. I just can't take 150 freshmen to visit a building. Um, it's in Pennsylvania. Right. Um, I will say, and again, please don't storm private property, but um, we have uh, what some have called the poor man's falling water here in Madison, um, the Pew House in Shorewood Hills which is set back from the road, privately owned home, um, was built over a ravine. And uh, the current owner has sort of enhanced the sense of the stream running through it. So that's why it's called the Four Man's Falling Water. It was designed by Wright and his apprentices, um, particularly Herb Fritz, uh, in the mid-1930s here in Madison. On the, well, some of the same ideas that motivated falling water. The best view of it, rent a boat um, from Steve Holtzman. Um, you can you can actually see the house best from the lake. And you can actually look back at it and um, I can give you more information if you're interested. Professor Andrew Jewski, uh, thank you for being with us today. We're just uh, in awe of your pedagogical innovations and the way that you're shaping education at UW. We commend you. Uh, the ELCA Lutheran tradition is one of reforming. And so I'm in awe of the way that you're putting the human in humanities. If you really want to preserve this because the gift that it will be to us is we're asking this question, what does it mean to be human? And so we fully support your work and just are so grateful you're with us today. Thank you for that. I, I'd like to do, it's unusual to me to, promote administration at um, <laughs> trying to run away from it personally. Um, my, our new chancellor has um, created an initiative for better understanding AI. And while that makes you recoil at one level, um, one of the things that we're trying to do in our history department is think about how AI can suggest our humanity. And so we put in for a faculty position um, that would, would consider the question of the human relative to the artificial intelligence that's all around us. So I appreciate that comment. The humanities has a hard road to well. Uh, in terms of the environment and the differences and the sameness between Taliesin and East, and Taliesin and West in Arizona, uh, how do the two differ in terms of fitting into the environment? That's a great question. I think, um, I, full disclosure, I haven't visited Taliesin West in about 30 years. Um, and when I visited initially, I wasn't thinking about right. I was thinking about 19th century prisons. So I, I have to say that, <laughs> um, I, you know, it, it's hard for me to answer that, other than to talk about Wright's philosophy, which is always designing around site. And so the materials responded to the site, the lines responded to the site, and that was true always, even with the prefabricated houses, which were house, they, they were prefab, pre-designed plans and kits, but also was, there was site work involved in each one. And that was important to write and to Marshall Erdman, who we partnered with to build those houses. And that's why the, the project never took off because the houses ended up being 50,000 instead of the economical seven or 8,000 that are in the division. 
So that doesn't answer your question specifically um, because I don't, I, I just don't teach Tallyas unless enough to, to be able to respond on the site other than or on the spot, other than to say that was something that was important to write throughout his entire career. Thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate it. I've been in Madison since 1954, so uh, I remember all the discussions about what has become the uh, Monona Terrace Convention Center. Uh, lots of discussions about this. So yeah. that, that's an interesting thing. Then, in terms of our adult forums here, we did have Professor Dennis speak some years ago when he was. I don't know if he had retired from the department by then, but that was very interesting to have him here in person. And um, well, they're just this brought forth all kinds of memories of this presentation of the uh, Unitarian facility. And I have been close to Italian and West, and of course, Italian and East here. I myself, as a non-professional, feel there's no comparison in terms of the feel, because when you are at one in Arizona, you're sort of looking out at lots of other buildings. I mean, you are elevated, but you don't have that same feeling that we have here in Spring Green, where there's such a relationship to the natural world right around one, so just as a non-professional, that's my read on that. Yeah. Thank you for everything this morning. It just brought all kinds of, how many, I was going to say centuries of history or decades of history to me. Thank you. Thank you. I did want to respond briefly to something I alluded to earlier, which is um, the Franklin Wright Foundation and the Talias Institute, the former Franklin Wright School of Architecture, which is not an accredited school of architecture anymore, but an education initiative within the foundation. Um, I, I did want to mention that they are working, trying to partner very aggressively with um, UW Madison and the Arizona State, that's in the Phoenix area, Tempe, um, to uh, develop programs that get undergraduates from both public universities out in uh, Taliesin and West and Taliesin East. We have a little bit of a challenge with Madison um, because we have to get students out there. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention, and I really hesitate to say this in this, in this crowd, but I will. Um, the last time I talked to the Franklin Wright class in uh, fall 2023, so last fall, um, I had 30 students, which was way too many, 30 undergraduate students. And I had 50 senior guest auditors who, no, 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 don't get too excited. They, did, they were not able to go on all of the field visits, but I curated um, a special uh, web page for them to experience the, the visits virtually. Um, some of them snuck in anyway, we'll, we'll put that aside. Um, but it was uh, those senior auditors, I mentioned it because several of them gave um, all donations so that I could uh, fund the trips to tell us in the next time I teach the class, which was super nice of them. So I just, I'm really taken by this idea of, you know, what does it mean to learn something? Because what you describe is you can learn about Frankway Wright's buildings, but you don't really know them until you experience them, and how that just happens in so many parts of our life. Even in a place like a church, where we can learn about God, about Jesus Christ, and have all that factual, or whatever, those factoids, you know, just right there at the surface, but we don't really know God or Jesus Christ until we experience um, and I've also, we live around kind of the corner from the Merton house, um, so walked my dog past there a lot and admired it. Um, 
But I live in that mid-century modern neighborhood too. And I remember moving from like a 1930s house in Sunset Hills to this 1959 house in Hill Farms and how I experienced those buildings so differently. And the, the Hill Farms house had lots of big windows. So I knew it got more sun, but it's totally different living there and then experiencing that light through the seasons um, yeah, so I'm just going to be thinking about that idea for a while. You can know about something, but you can know something from experience, and they're totally different. So this, can you arguably know something just by learning about it? So I'll, I'll give a follow-up point, if I may, to that. So the lamp house is the, um, the one I use for the transitional Victorian building. It's very dark, and part of that is that dwarfed by all of the new developments around it. But part of it was this, the nature of there weren't any windows, like you were talking about. And so we went there the first week, and students were like, you know, oh, yeah, they recognize this prairie feature and this feature, right, it's architecture, blah, blah, blah. Um, so then the next week, we went to the Pew House, which was sort of opening up onto the lake. And they were like, oh, this is so different. I can't believe this is the same architect. Like, it, it, again, they could, for books, say, oh, this is a very style because it's horizontal and you know, these kinds of things. And, oh, I see the dark wood that he used here. But they didn't understand the feeling that the buildings imparted and when they had that visit. So part of what I'm trying to do, I guess, is, and, and now I'm teaching way more introductory. This, this is a 400 level, sort of intermediate level class, but most of my teaching now is to freshmen and introductory and at one level it's like okay learn the history of renaissance the modern art right but i've tried to try to take even those big classes and make them be less about the facts which they can get on wikipedia let's be honest they can learn about michelangelo and not all correct on wikipedia um but getting them to think about you know how renaissance i was just in spain during holy week so i really saw this but like you know how renaissance ideas inform how things still happen, like Holy Week processions in Southern Spain. Like, that's what I want them to think about, and no. And there, it's, that's more difficult um, to teach, but I, it, I don't know, maybe it's my age, but it's like to me as I sort of look toward retirement, it's like that's what I want them to do. I want to educate citizens, not teach them facts about our history, which they can get on their own, on their little phones. Uh, thank you again for the presentation. Um, I guess uh, one thing that strikes me is, you know, that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright had uh, designed all these, you know, very grand, large buildings, um, you know, our churches, and you know, and yet he was also kind of obsessed with, you know, um, residential spaces and and even prefab houses, trying to make them practical, even if they weren't totally practical in the end. And, yeah, I just you know, I think that's a little bit of a contrast. You could have easily have just specialized in doing large projects, and yet he was interested in sort of personal spaces. And I, 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 I sort of intrigues me. It seems like that may be unusual. I don't know the history of architecture, but um, I think that to me a very interesting part of that place. I'd say quickly one of the themes that Lily, the student I quoted at the end, was really interested in was. Frankly, right is not anymore. And I think that relates to your comment. Um, one might argue that he was doing all kinds of projects because he was constantly in debt. Some of it of his own doing. Um, yeah, the next bill, most of it. Um, and a part of it might be that he was just looking to make a buck. Um, but he always was interested in modern technology, prefab, and always interested in. Uh, you can't pre that up in today in Milwaukee. Um, but this is the built houses. We have one in Madison. Happy to talk about anyone to anyone. But he was always interested in that. And I think it's it's super interesting to think about that. It's also, I challenge everybody to think about another architect that really had an influence in domestic architecture to the extent that Wright did. 
architects and Walter Gropius built his own house. You know, um, Philip Johnson built his own house. We know these as monuments of modern architecture, but we don't have another house architect that we think about as we do with Wright. So that really speaks to your point. And I, I'm still working through that myself, but it's an interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on that because it seems like with his residential projects. He really obsessed on the user experience, like how sort of so. Well, there are these stories, and I don't know if they're true, but there are these stories of how he would design everything down to the napkin rings that would sit on the dinner table, and that people then would live in it and find out how the challenges of living in that space. And then if he came back for a visit, he would immediately start putting the house together the way he had designed it. So he, he, there was an obsession about how people's actual lives would interface with his vision of that space. Um, that would drive me crazy, but, you know. And it did. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a very, I don't mean to get all theoretical uh, here, it's a very modern form of design. Um, that's not that's not necessarily unusual. I mean, his degree, the degree of it is unusual, but like you know, the Corbusier, Phil Johnson had a similar vision. You know, Phil Johnson, Phil Johnson in his own house um, in the UK and Connecticut designed it. My students love this building. It's a glass house, so glass walls on a sort of um, it's a base, concrete base, I guess, and steel frame, um, entirely open. How practical is that? But it was this idea that it was pure, like pure architecture. It's like, but I want to go to the bathroom. Like, you know, what do I, I want to change my clothes. What do I, so, you know, it, that's kind of a modern relation. But it, but it is interesting that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you could just indulge me for a moment, I've been sitting here also, also thinking about Jens Jensen who was sure. very active in the really ecological, environmental, um, prairie kinds of um, restoration. And, Correct. And I think he was living at some point about the same time as uh, Wright. Um, I may be wrong, but he has... A little been, earlier. But he did some work here in Madison. and. Uh, the Glen, Children's Glen Park just down the road and the um, the circles, the uh, council circles at Lake Wingra and, and in the Glen Park. And whether or what or if there are any relationships between Wright and Jensen and if they overlap. Uh, that's what I was also thinking with your wonderful presentation. Thank you. No, I appreciate the question. So um, I'm going to kick it to my colleague, one of the best historians I've ever met, Tom Martinelli, who talks specifically about the children's park. Um, but uh, I will say I just taught O.C. Simons and Jensen in another class. Um, and I think they're a little earlier, but they're associated with the prairie school as it's become known of landscape architecture, which was about using the environment as a driver for design, loosely design, but a little earlier. And I would associate with um, Wright's prairie phase. So, more so. I don't, Tom, I don't know if you anything else to add. Yeah. No, it's related, but they're, the connections aren't like, as I understand it, that they were working together. Right. Two more questions. I, I have just a quick comment. One thing I remember from the Falling Water tour is people saying, Where are the closets? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I, know. <laughs> I mean, my comment to that is always like, you know, the <laughs> idea is expressment over the practical. Right. Thank you so much for an incredible presentation. I also thank you for thinking about your presentation and feeling Good point. very similar about AI. But the idea too that you could take your students virtually to fall in water in a 3D virtual reality experience to be able to capture some of that in the impractical of taking students, you know, how many hundred yeah. miles away yeah. to Pennsylvania, but being able to create 
aspect or ability to be virtual and hear and I, I, I think, um, look, I teach online um, some of the time, and I, I have embraced some of these, these technologies. Um, we have to, um, just like we have to accept. I let my students use computers and phones and lecture halls. I'm not one of those people. Look, when I was in college, I didn't always listen to the Professor, right? I was doodling and doing my own thing. They're going to do that, but it's been extraordinary because students be like, the Professor, I just noticed on, you know, I searched this term and I found this. And it like actually affects this discussion. So your point is, is there. Um, I don't think with these buildings around us, I would be satisfied just teaching virtual reality. Yeah. But it can, bringing them together, I think, is important. I would agree with that. Thank you. Just a couple of things. Um, brought up Bill Martinelli a number of times. He spoke on history of Westmoreland in February, right in March. Oh, so, yeah. um, oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Anyway, and so that's up on YouTube. So if you missed that presentation, you'll hear about the history of Westmoreland. Seriously, the the book that Bob has written is a model for the history. Yeah. And that's in our library collection, this book, too. So. Um, and next week, um, we're happy to call the Ministry of Reading fundraising campaign coming in to give a hundred percent sure, but an update on that. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, that was for sale about 20 years ago.